everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, we are so excited to have you back with us as we celebrate Black History Month and have the incredible Tammy Brown here to join us. So before we jump in, I want to say a few things just to acknowledge that the land um, upon which Paulsdale sits, though we are unfortunately not there today, is the traditional territory of the Lene Lenape, which they know as Lenape Hoking. The uh, Lenape people lived here for thousands of years, and though many of them were removed north and west, many also remain among the continuing historical tribal communities of the region. So we acknowledge and honor them. And we also just want to point out to everyone today that while we are grateful for all of you joining us and we invite you to share your questions during our Q&A period at the program and to introduce yourselves in our chat, um, the chat is really for relevant thoughts and ideas to the program. And this space is intended for comments and considerations um, that pertain there. Additional feedback can be shared with us via the response form that we will email to all of you after the program. And we hope you will respond and tell us in detail what you thought about today. We are dedicated to making all our spaces, virtual and otherwise, safe and inclusive for everyone. Harassment of any kind will not be tolerated in verbal or written comments during API programs. If anyone chooses to engage in racist, sexist, trans or homophobic speech or any other kind of harassment or bullying behavior, they will be removed from the program without further warning. Thank you for being a part of our community and for partnering with us to make sure we remain dedicated to equality for all in word and in deed. So I am now so excited to tell you about Tammy Brown, our professor who will be joining us to speak today if you wanna come back on Tammy. Tammy is Associate Professor of Global and Intercultural Studies and History at Miami University of Ohio. She earned her bachelor's in international history magna cum laude from Harvard and her PhD in American history and African diaspora studies from Princeton. Tammy's teaching, writing and service to her community are connected through her interest in art, social justice and biography as a methodological approach. In her first book, City of Islands, Caribbean Intellectuals in New York, Dr. Brown uses the life stories of Caribbean intellectuals as windows into the dynamic history of immigration to New York and the long battle for racial equality in modern America. Her current book project, Hear My Freedom, is a biography of Jimi Hendrix, centering on the spiritual dimensions of his music. Tammy's research on race, feminism, art, and politics has been featured in various media outlets, including TEDx, the American Civil, Li Civil Liberty Union's blog, NPR, and Vox.com. Dr. Brown's selected awards include the Hayden Wilkins Faculty Fellowship and the Levatas Powell at St Outstanding Faculty Diversity Award at Miami University, and a research grant from the Gilder Lehrman Institute. Thank you so much for being with us, Tammy. I'm going to turn it over to you. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Um, I wish I could see your faces. It's always a little odd when I can't see the audience, but um, I am imagining you out there. Thank you for joining us. And I'm excited to talk about the women's suffrage movement, especially issues of intersectionality and African-American women's contributions to the movement. I'm gonna jump right in and share my PowerPoint with you. Uh, Keep in mind, I'll ask some questions throughout the presentation and ask you to write your responses in the chat. I just want to make sure we're engaged um, in the African-American tradition of call and response. Uh, I wanna make sure we're communicating even throughout the presentation process. Okay, I'm gonna share my screen with you now. Okay, so I chose the two historical figures, Sojourner Truth and Fannie Lou Hamer, because I see these two women as being major bookends in the struggle for voting rights for African-American women. Uh, when I wrote the article for the American Civil Liberties Union uh, a couple years ago, um, in discussions about 
the 100th anniversary of the 19th Amendment, I talked about the 19th Amendment not being this all-inclusive um, legislation that allowed all women to vote because African-American women were still excluded for so many reasons that we're going to get into as the presentation um, progresses. And it's really not until the 1960s classic civil rights movement that African-American women and men have this full, full sense, as full as possible, of enfranchisement. So the title is From Sojourner Truth to Fannie Lou Hamer, Black Women and the Long Battle for Voting Rights. These are our learning objectives for today. Um, I'm, I know some of these terms will be familiar to you. So, you know, we'll be practicing knowledge you already know, but hopefully we'll be making some new connections too. So first we should all be able to define intersectionality and apply the theory to historical examples and current events. We're gonna analyze the history of black women's suffrage as it pertains to issues of power privilege and oppression. We're gonna explain why the 19th Amendment did not grant the right to vote to the majority of African-American women, but the 1965 Voting Rights Act did. So starting with the concept of intersectionality, we have to talk about the legal scholar, Kimberly Crenshaw, who worked alongside Derrick Bell, the late Derrick Bell um, legal scholar who taught at Harvard University for years. And together they created critical race theory. And a cornerstone of critical race theory is the concept of intersectionality. I, I believe in, I, I would love to hear what you think in the chat, the topic of intersectionality has been a buzzword definitely in the, the past five years in the public debate over police brutality, racial profiling, the murder of un, unarmed Black citizens, the Black Lives Matter movement. So I find that this is a term that even my students um, are more aware of. I've been teaching now for almost 15 years. If I were teaching um, an introductory course to a course I used to teach was called Introduction to Black World Studies, meaning the African diaspora, 15 years ago, I would ask, you know, what does intersectionality mean? On average, mm, I'd say less than 5% of my classes might know, if that. But today, because of ongoing debates in um, the news, in academic settings, in activist settings, these terms are better known, but these terms, especially critical race theory, are more, um, there's more misinformation about all these terms too. And if we have time, we can talk about how that's problematic. All right, intersectionality. The complex cumulative way in which the effects of multiple forms of discrimination, such as racism, sexism, classism, and keep in mind there are other isms, you know, homophobia, transphobia. Um, sometimes you can even have regionalisms, right? If you have a Southern accent, there's so many different possibilities combine, overlap or intersect, especially in the experiences of marginalized individuals or group or groups. When it comes to thinking about how inequalities persist, categories like gender, race, and class are best understood as overlapping and mutually constitutive rather than isolated and distinct. So Kimberly Crenshaw has this great TED talk in which she, in which she talks about this concept of intersectionality based on legal cases that she studied when she coined the phrase, this term um, in the late 80s, early 90s. And she found that black women, especially in work settings were being left out. So for example, um, if it were an employer who hired white women and hired black men, but discriminated against black women, that intersection of race and gender 
is a unique identity that often was overlooked in the legal system. So, you know, someone might argue, oh, we're not sexist, we hire women, but they're only white women. Oh, we're not racist, we hire um, black people. But again, that intersectionality of race and gender meant black women were being left out. Today, we can think of, oh, there, there are infinite types of intersectionality. If we consider sexual orientation and um, the, the various gender identities, we know, unfortunately, the highest rate of violence against uh, trans women of color, it's atrocious. And, and the average lifespan of a Black trans woman is only 35 years old. So that is an intersectional identity that is at high risk of violence, right? That trans Black trans woman's experience is going to be very different than, you know, a white trans woman's experience or a white woman's experience, et cetera. Okay, to make sure we fully grasp the concept, I'm going to pause and, and ask you to write into the chat, can you think of an example of intersectionality that you've witnessed or experienced in your personal life or in the public sphere? If so, describe your example in one to two sentences in the chat. And I'm just going to take a moment to look at your responses. Are you all writing? <laughs> if, if we're feeling shy, I don't mind uh, continuing and we can return to this. I'm not seeing any new responses here. So, okay. Oh, great. I'm starting to get some responses. Okay. So Alyssa says, as a teacher, I witnessed students of color from urban areas who had fewer resources devoted to them that hurt their college chances. Yes, that is a good example of an intersectional identity that I am also very much interested in committed to working with um, students of color in schools with, with very low resources. I'm currently working with Cincinnati Public Schools teaching African-American history this year. And the concept is based on um, culturally, culturally relevant pedagogy, meaning if these students of color, black and brown students are learning history lessons, literature lessons that include black and brown authors, they're gonna feel more connected and energized. And keep in mind, there's a whole body of literature that proves this. So in understanding the intersectional identities of these students, we can better serve them, right? Okay, yes, voter suppression laws, yes. Voter suppression laws have an intersectional effect with differential impact on the basis of both race and sex so that black women are doubly disadvantaged. I think the 19th amendment, okay, denying it, yes, okay. Okay, so I think we get it. We get it. We get the concept of intersectionality. Let's move on to our next slide. African-American women and suffrage during slavery. The icon, the classic uh, example of the one of the earliest Black women who spoke out against racism and slavery. Sojourner Truth was an abolitionist and she spoke in um, favor of voting rights for all women. So Sojourner Truth was born around 1797 in New York. She died in 1883. Her birth name was Isabella Van Wagner. She changed her name to Sojourner Truth in 1843. 
she was a Pentecostal preacher and itinerant minister. So she would travel around the country, speaking, preaching the gospel. Uh, she was an abolitionist and a feminist. She's known for attending the Women's Rights Convention in Akron, Ohio in 1851. This is important. So I'd like to pause for a moment to look at this image of Sojourner Truth. She would make money by selling carte de visite. So these are calling cards. So these cards would have a, an, an image of her on it usually with a caption that said something like, I sell the shadow to support the substance. So for Sojourner Truth, depicting herself in a dignified, refined, into intellectual fashion was part of her abolitionist work against popular ideas of Black inferiority. I'm gonna challenge you now with with a few questions. Okay, so the historian Nell Irvin Painter wrote a book length study as Sojourner Truth. And her book is called Sojourner Truth, A Life, A Symbol, because she explores the actual lived experiences of Sojourner Truth, as well as the ways in which mainly white feminists tried to manipulate her image and her legacy to better fit their ideas and their notions of um, what Blackness is. I'm going to cut to the chase and say, Sojourner Truth never said, ain't I a woman? That phrase that is echoed and repeated as this declaration of women's empowerment and um, this, this phrase that also gets at that intersectional identity of fighting racism, of slavery, fighting sexism, ain't I a woman? She never said that. Uh, let's write in the chat, out of curiosity, how many of you have heard that before that she never said, ain't I a woman? So I love this. Okay, some people have heard it. Some people have heard it. Um, remind me to return to this at the very end if we have time. I have linked, hyperlinked the original speech by Sojourner Truth versus the um, speech that has been manipulated and revised by white feminist Francis Gage. Um, and the main difference between the two is uh, the Francis Gage revisions incorporate a more colloquial kind of down home, almost um, Southern broken English dialect. And um, basically the historian Nell Painter argues that uh, these white feminists still wanted Sojourner Truth to represent um, this symbol of feminism, but because of their own racism, they could not fathom a, a fully intellectual Black woman um, who could stand side by side for the cause. So they manipulated her image, made her sound, um, you know, more down home, colloquial in order to fit prevalent stereotypes of Blackness at the time. And in contrast, I'm going to return back to this photograph. In contrast, the historian Nell Painter also argues that we should read these primary sources, these carte de visite, as Sojourner Truth's own um, explanation of who she is. This is her self-declaration of, you know, no matter how someone might try to revise or manipulate her words, she is telling us she is dignified. She's wearing, you know, this Victorian like dress. She's wearing a shawl and other pictures. She's knitting. This is a leisure activity. She's wearing spectacles. So she's presenting herself as a dignified woman that's quite different than widespread, even abolitionist. Um, photographs that featured uh, the scars, scarred backs of, of violence endured during slavery. So these are a few quotes from Sojourner Truth, A Life Assemble. 
the persona that filled a need in American political culture as straight talking, authentic and unsentimental. That was the function of the image, the symbol of Sojourner Truth. Also, Truth, the itinerant preacher, created and marketed the persona of a charismatic woman who had been a slave and it is precisely through her marketing of herself, or as she put it, her selling the shadow to support the substance that her name is known today. So I like this quote because we see the agency of Sojourner Truth and the fact that these images of Sojourner Truth endure, that's a way of us uh, getting a window into her intellectual um, makeup and her, her thinking and her perception of herself and her awareness of the complexities of Black identity and the public sphere and how that identity can be um, you know, distorted based on racist notions. Now, let's think about the history of voting rights. Uh, the 15th Amendment ratified in 1870, the right of citizens of the United States to vote shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or by any state on account of race, color, or previous condition of servitude, which technically should have given African-American men the right to vote, but for the same reason why the 19th Amendment did not really give African-American women the right to vote, um, Black men, even with the passage of the 15th Amendment, suffered so much um, racist discrimination and practices um, from poll taxes to um, arriving at a, a, a voting poll and being forced to recite key parts of the constitution, even obscure parts of the constitution to um, in state by state, there would be different practices and they could range also from grandfather clauses saying, oh, if your grandfather did not vote, then you cannot vote. And obviously that's intended to prevent black men from voting and then later black women from voting because their grandparents were slaves. So there's no way that they could vote. So here you have this uh, tension between the federal government and states. And we think about this in terms of um, de facto and de jure um, types of discrimination. So if something was done in practice, for example, you know, some of the worst cases were scenarios in which a black person might be asked to guess the number of marbles in a jar in order to vote. You know, absolutely absurd, absolutely ridiculous. But these are the types of barriers and resistance, white supremacist resistance um, that were practiced um, that prevented African-American men from voting after the 15th Amendment and still prevented African-American women from voting. So in 1920, with the passage of the 19th Amendment, um, the right of citizens of the United States uh, should be able to vote and not denied based on sex. Once again, this really just referred to white women. There are always exceptions to the rules here and there. Some elite privileged African-American women um, who were usually descendants of freed people or just of an elite class might be able to vote here and there, but they were really outliers for the most part. Um, Black women and men did not have full access to the vote until the civil rights movement in the 60s. So African-American women and suffrage in the progressive era. Although there were so many barriers in terms of racist practices against African-Americans, um, I really see the 1880s to the 1920s as this very important time in which black owned run institutions made headway and, and really pushed for progress. So racial uplift overlaps with the progressive era in America, 
And racial uplift is known as a system, a practice of institution building, uh, community outreach by African-American intellectuals, political activists, religious leaders to improve the social and economic standing of black people in America. So in other words, there were so many examples in which the United States government made it obvious that they were not going to help African-Americans transition from slavery to freedom um, in a smooth fashion. So African-American intellectuals took it upon themselves. Pause for a moment, you know, historically we had the Freedmen's Bureau that offered some assistance. Um, even the classic question of 40 acres and a mule, the promise that former slaves would be given land, uh, 40 acres of land and a mule. Once again, there are a few cases here and there in which African-Americans did receive that. But for the most part, after the end of reconstruction and white racist backlash against any advancements that African-Americans were making, especially in the political arena, the United States government does not make good on any, or, or does not make good on the promises to assist. So you have um, African-American intellectuals who often work alongside white liberals to build historically black colleges, including Tuskegee University in 1888. I have a lot of love for Tuskegee University because my sister graduated from there. She's a chemical engineer and it's still known as a premier institution for especially majoring in engineering. Um, you have the National Association of Colored Women's Clubs uh, founded in 1896 and some key figures are Ida B. Wells, Mary Church Terrell, um, Frances Harper. You have the Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority founded in 1908 at Howard University, which has also gotten more attention since our vice president, our first vice president of the United States to be a woman of color, Kamala Harris, we know is um, black and of South Asian descent. Um, both her parents were immigrants and she went to Howard. She was a member, she is a member of the sorority, AKA. And I think even with the support that Kamala Harris received first during her bid uh, for the Democratic Party nomination to be president. And then, you know, after she decided she, she wasn't a contender and, and pulled out and then later got on the ticket with Biden, I think the support that we saw from African-American voters, but especially from members of historically black colleges and sororities and fraternities shows that this is a rich history uh, I think that has been overlooked and undervalued, but that still really is important um, to, the, to the success, especially the socioeconomic success of African-Americans in this country. I have countless anecdotes I could tell you to, to prove that point um, if we have time. Also 1909, um, probably one of the most well-known institutions, the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, founded by the great intellectual, African-American intellectual W.E.B. Du Bois and others. Let's talk about Ida B. Wells and her presence, her, her intellectual presence and political activism concerning the right of, of women voting and African-American women voting. So Ida B. Wells was a writer, public intellectual and an activist born in 1862 in Holly Springs, um, died in Chicago, she attended Rust College and Fisk University. She was a co-founder in the National Association of Colored Women's Clubs, also a co-founder in the, the acronym is NAACP, as I was just talking about, W.E.B. Du Bois was a founder alongside Ida B. Wells. 1893, 1894, she did a very monumental anti-lynching tour in Europe. Uh, I'm gonna pose a question here. 
So Ida B. Wells was not one the um, not necessarily an anti-lynching activist until these dates because she experienced a tragedy that really affected her. So one of her friends was lynched. Um, her friend was a successful African-American businessman. He owned a grocery store. And at the time, this black owned grocery store was in competition with a white grocery store, but the black owned grocery store was, was doing better financially. So really, so really out of jealousy and hatred for this um, black owned store's success and the owner's success, three African-American businessmen were attacked by um, a group of white men and killed. And the most common allegation during this reign of, of domestic terror, the most common allegation was that these um, overwhelmingly African-American male, keep in mind here and there, there were some examples of African-American women who were lynched, some examples of Jewish Americans, Italian Americans, but overwhelmingly these were African-American men who were successful. The allegations were usually something to the effect that, uh, that a man tried to flirt with a white woman or you know, made a comment that was inappropriate or had slept with a white woman or the, you know, the most aggressive um, allegations were allegations of rape. In reality, these allegations were usually false and these men were usually successful businessmen. And at the time, W.E.B. Du Bois, um, even in his, in his book, Black Reconstruction, talks about poor white, um, poor white anger for the fact that uh, African Americans were no longer enslaved. So poor whites can no longer say, oh, obviously I'm superior to, better than, Black people because they're slaves and I'm free. But once African Americans were making money, and in, in some cases, you know, as much money as poor whites were or more money, there's this status and anxiety that that occurs that Du Bois then calls it the wages of whiteness. That uh, white people said, oh, whiteness has a certain cultural capital that means something so that we have this value even if we see African-Americans doing better than us. Now let's, let's connect the dots here and talk about how this relates to Ida B. Wells. So this relates to Ida B. Wells in the sense she's just heartbroken and, and angered by the murder of her friend, you know, this upstanding man in the community. And she decides to speak out against it, um, speak out against lynching. And she chooses to uh, go to Europe, especially she spent a lot of time in the UK and Britain. And she spoke out against violence against Black people in America. And she said things, or, or let me pause and, and ask you this question. Why might it be more uh, effective to, to travel abroad and talk about racism and civil rights violations and really domestic terrorism um, that Black people were experiencing in America? What was the benefit of traveling to Europe to talk about this issue instead of just staying home and speaking out? I'm going to go to the chat here to see what you say. That's true, that's true. It was less dangerous to travel to Europe because um, kind of the, the same rules did not apply. Um, Ida B. Wells safety, her physical safety was more at risk traveling throughout the United States. Yes, this is perfect. Uh, I'm, I'm reading Val says international pressure could make, um, could maybe help put pressure on U.S. lawmakers. That's perfect. So this is true. This is actually a strategy known as Black internationalism. So this, inter this traveling abroad and speaking out 
about racism in the United States was a strategy that Ida B. Wells used alongside other African-American intellectuals, including the brilliant um, performer, singer, actor, Paul Robeson, who traveled to Europe, especially Russia, and spoke out against racism at the United States. He spoke out so much that in 1952, Paul Robeson's passport was revoked. You had uh, Josephine Baker, who used her celebrity status as an entertainer, as a dancer. Uh, she spent, and she actually moved to um, France. She spoke out against racism at home. You have countless examples, right? Including jazz pianist Hazel Scott. And the reason they wanted to um, use this international platform as a theater of shame, I like to call it a theater of shame, to shame the United States into reforming. Um, the fact that they are speaking out in front of um, predominantly white audiences abroad, the fact that uh, the United States has roots in, um, you know, being a former British well, system of colonies and Ida B. Wells used language, including, oh, the United States professes to be so democratic, um, professes to be leaders of civilization and progress, but look, uh, racist whites are doing this barbaric thing of, of, attacking, killing, hanging, burning Black people for crimes they never committed. And through that language of turning, you know, white supremacist ideas on their head, where white supremacist ideology would say Black people are inferior and, and even are not human, she says, listen, it is this atrocious um, practice in the United States that white people are attacking, killing in a barbaric way. And you need to know about this with the hope of reform. Let's now talk about Ida B. Wells' intersectional identity. So I say the, the anti-lynching campaign definitely brought her identity, her racial identity to the forefront, her solidarity with Black people and Black men who were attacked. Um, but the March on Washington in 1913 um, really is a great example of Ida B. Wells' courage and her, her determination. Even while experiencing racism uh, within the, the suffrage struggle, so she had planned to march with the Illinois delegation, she and other members, um, African-American women that she traveled with, but um, even Alice Paul, and keep in mind, you know, I know this is the, the Alice Paul Institute, but none of our historical figures are perfect. None of our historical figures are blameless. blameless. There are some good sources online that, break down how even Alice Paul's account of what happened um, in Washington, D.C. in 1913 during the March on Washington differ from accounts in the Black press, including the famous uh, Black pub publication, The Crisis. But based on, uh, you know, well-researched historical facts, um, we know that Ida B. Wells was asked to march at the back of the line um, because the rationale was Southern white suffragists would be offended if the Black women, the African-American women, marched with their state delegations like everyone else. And I love the fact that Ida B. Wells just says no. You know, I think I see this history as uh, we see examples of struggle and triumph. We see examples of tragedy and triumph. So I think part of the tragedy is to even ask Ida B. Wells, this, this brilliant woman to march at the back of the line. And it's almost like that, that funny little, you know, lame excuse, like, it's not me, I don't think this, it's them, but can you just do this favor for us, right? And she says, 
No, you know, so that's the triumph, I think, is her bravery um, it, in refusing to be segregated in this march on Washington for women's rights and the vote in 1913. This source uh, is from the Library of Congress. Um, and I just like this picture so we can get some images in our heads of who these African-American women were. You can definitely see by the way they're dressed that the politics of respectability are at the center of how they're seeing themselves as citizens and how they're seeing themselves as on a mission to uplift uh, each other and the, the black women's clubs at the time, there's this very common mantra of lifting as we climb. So this idea that as you are improving your social status, you should also help other African-Americans in your community do the same. These women such as Nell Nanny Helen Burroughs on the far left um, were considered race women, meaning they were leaders of their race. Um, this is a picture of them, of Nanny Burroughs and fellow African-American suffragists um, who attend the Banner State Women's National Baptist Convention in 1915. And they're all wearing hats and they look marvelous. I, I love like these historical documents that say so much about how you how you want to present yourself to the world and, and what that means, right? Even in the way they're presenting themselves to the world, they're countering, they're trying to fight against negative stereotypes, stereotypes of blackness. Okay, so alongside Ida B. Wells, we have Mary Church Terrell, public intellectual and activist, born in Memphis, 1863, died in uh, Maryland, 1954. She attended Oberlin College. And this is important because Oberlin College turned out to be um, an, an educational locus um, for not only white women's voting rights, so like a community that was progressive in educating women to um, assert their citizenship, but a number of African-American women um, attended and met and, and they would have conversations and encourage each other throughout their political careers. Uh, she co-founded the National Association of Colored Women's Clubs. And she is known for a speech that she made in Washington, DC in 1898. And she is really the only African-American woman who is invited to talk at this all white event. And um, she presents a discussion called The Progress of Colored Women. Long before, you know, this is long before the concept of intersectionality is even introduced into academic language. She's talking about, oh, Black women's intersectional identities as Black and women means they have a double oppression. And she just, in a very courageous way is trying to remind white suffragists that, okay, you have it bad because we're fighting for the right to vote, but keep in mind, black women um, have experienced a certain type of racialized oppression, slavery, that also meant that their bodies and, and their lives were at risk in a way that white women might not fully understand. So she talks about the concept of human beings being property and the fact that, um, you know, black women were raped during slavery. And we know that in this capitalist perverse institution, that was a way in which um, slave masters built their, their wealth by um, the, the fact that slaves born to enslave, well, enslaved women who had children, um, the children would take on the status of the mother, right? So she says the, the African-American women at the time, the term was colored. She says, look, colored women are making progress, but in, in so many words, white women should really support and applaud this progress considering how far 
African American women had come from slavery to um, uplifting themselves in that in that project of racial uplift during the progressive era. Okay, I'm gonna ask you to do a close reading now. I this is a good a good way to pause and hear your feedback because I feel like I've been talking so much. I wanna give you a chance to, to talk back at me. So you're gonna analyze the above quote and summarize the author's main point. Okay, this is an excerpt from Mary Church Terrell's speech. She says, consider if you will, the almost insurmountable obstacles which have confronted colored women in their efforts to educate and cultivate themselves since their emancipation. And I dare assert, not boastfully, but with pardonable pride, I hope that the progress they have made and the work they have accomplished will bear a favorable comparison, at least, with that of their more fortunate sisters. From the opportunity of acquiring knowledge and the means of self-culture have never been entirely withheld. Four, not only are colored women with ambition and aspiration handicapped on account of their sex, but they are everywhere baffled and mocked on account of their race. So let's take a moment and type into the chat, analyze the above quote and summarize the author's main point. Yes, definitely I see in the chat, education matters. Yes. Yes, all women can make progress regardless of race. Yes, okay, I say, um, Mary Church Terrell is asking the white women present to acknowledge the incredible black women are because um, they found ways to thrive despite being deprived of advantages. Yes. So this is all good. I agree. This is a great description of intersectionality. I saw someone type into the chat, perfect description of intersectionality, right? She's saying, if you notice, let's highlight that fortunate sisters. Hmm. In a way, it's like, okay, listen. Oh, sorry. I, my my computer. Okay, in a way, she's saying, hey, look, in in and usually I don't, you know, you hear this term of oppression Olympics. I usually I don't like the idea of the oppression Olympics. Who has it worse, right? But the fact that racialized slavery in America was so, you know, tragic and traumatic and, and, and devastating and is the foundation of the wealth of the United States. I think this is important to talk about, right? Uh, she's saying in, in so many words that um, these white suffragists she's talking to had so many more opportunities and, um, are a lot more fortunate than your average African-American woman. So she feels as if the progress of African-American women should be especially recognized and celebrated and applauded and supported. All right, uh, I'm kind of keeping my eye on the clock and I'm, I'm hoping I can get through this in the next 10 minutes. So we have time at the end for question and answers. So now we're gonna talk about African-American women and voting rights in the civil rights era. This is an important um, historical event, Mississippi, 1964, Freedom Summer. White college students came to Western College in 
Oxford, Ohio. Actually, the Western College campus is now part of my university, Miami University of Ohio. They trained alongside Black students and activists from Mississippi. Um, and the whole point of Freedom Summer was to register Black voters in Mississippi. So much disenfranchisement and intimidation um, was prevalent. White racist white people really just intimidating black people, um, threatening them so that there was fear of even registering to vote. But this group of students decided to um, band together and work to register African-Americans to vote. Unfortunately, before the, the volunteers all arrived, there was tragedy. Um, these three men, Mickey Schwerner, James Cheney, Andrew Goodman, you know, very young college students, they went down to Mississippi early before the large, the, the big group, just to assess the situation, and they were murdered. So for a long time, they were missing, and for the Black activists, you know, they feared the worst because they had experience with such intimidation and violence. They feared the worst. I think for many of the white students who came from elite, very privileged backgrounds, they didn't know. They weren't quite sure, you know, what happened until their bodies were discovered. And this, I think, is a turning point. Um, you have this artist, this vocalist, Nina Simone, who in 1964 writes, records, performs the song Mississippi Goddamn, um, talking about these deaths as being so tragic and um, sad and, and just, it makes her feel angry that people, racist people were getting away with this. And I think this is important because you see even the tone of the music changed. Nina Simone is known as the secular voice of the civil rights movement uh, because look at the title, Mississippi Goddamn. You know, it's, it's in your face. It's talking about frustration and rage. Compare that to the, the gospel roots of the other protest songs, like We Shall Overcome, um, you know, I'm not going to let anyone turn me around. These were usually Negro spirituals and gospel songs that were turned in to freedom fighting songs. But you have this new frustration and edge that comes with this tragedy. You also have the world, uh, well, the spotlight on this brilliant activist, Fannie Lou Hamer, who is a farmer from Mississippi. And she eloquently talks about her uh, experience with intimidation. This is a very famous speech in which she talks about um, in, in 1964, I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired. I have just a very brief excerpt from this uh, speech that we're gonna watch just now. So as we watch this, I just want you to pay attention to Fannie Lou Hamer, um, to her energy, to her manner of speaking, and keep in mind, uh, the president of the United States did not want this to air. Uh, there is a lot of effort to try to, try to prevent Fannie Lou Hamer's voice from being heard, but she, you know, this this clip of her speech did air and it did get a lot of uh, sympathy. So let's see why. Mr. Chairman and to the Credentials Committee, my name is Mrs. Fannie Lou Hamer and I live at 626 East Lafayette Street, Roosevelt, Mississippi. Sunflower County, the home of Senator James O. Eastman and Senator Stennis. It was the 31st of August in 1962 that 18 of us traveled 26 miles to the county courthouse in Indianola to try to register to become first class citizens. We was met in Indianola with, by policemen, 
highway patrolmen, and they only allowed two of us in to take the literacy test at the time. After we had taken this test and started back to Roosevelt, we were held up by the city police and the state highway patrolmen and carried back to Indianola, where the bus driver was charged that day was driving a bus the wrong color. After we paid the fine among us, we continued on to Roosevelt, and Reverend Jeff Sonny carried me four miles in the rural area where I had worked as a timekeeper and sharecropper for 18 years. I was met there by my children who told me the plantation owner was angry because I had gone down try to register. After they told me, my husband came and said the plantation owner was raising cane because I had tried to register. And before he quit talking, the plantation owner came and said, Fannie Lou, do you know, did Pap tell you what I said? And I said, yes, sir. He said, well, I mean that, that if you don't go down and withdraw your registration, you will have to leave. That then if you go down and withdraw, that you still might have to go because we are not ready for that in Mississippi. And I addressed him and told him that I didn't try to register for you. I tried to register for myself. I had to leave that same night. On the 10th of September, 1962, 16 bullets were fired into the home of Mr. and Mrs. Robert Tucker for me. That same night, two girls were shot in Roosevelt, Mississippi. Also, Mr. Joe McDonald's house was shot in. Okay. So the point is the stakes were high, right? Registering to vote meant your livelihood was on the line. The majority of uh, Black Americans in the South were sharecroppers which I tell my students, you know, it, it's really a step above slavery in the sense that sharecroppers uh, were in a vicious cycle of debt. They had um, a portion of land on um, a plantation owned by a white owner. They would have to share a portion of their crop as payment for using the land. They would have to buy the seed, the agricultural equipment from the white owner. Um, they were usually, they barely made any money at all. So you hear the threat that was repeated. The white uh, plantation owner said, if you don't revoke your registration to vote, basically your livelihood is at stake. She gave examples of violence, of, of houses being shot up and, and people being shot for uh, wanting to vote, for registering to vote. Okay, this is an excerpt from Fannie Lou Hamer. Uh, analyze the tone and content of Hamer's testimony. Why do you think President Lyndon B. Johnson did not want the nation to hear Hamer's testimony? Um, let me, Alyssa, let me ask you a question. Alyssa, to make sure we have enough time for uh, questions and answers in this, in this segment, do you want me to end with this and then open it up? I think that might be best. Okay. We're running up against our time limit in about 15 minutes. Sure. So um, maybe you already started typing into the chat, but I want to know uh, why do you think President Lyndon B. Johnson did not want the nation to hear Fannie Lou Hamer's testimony? Yes, it's an embarrassment to the United States. Yes, you know, this sad history is repeating itself, voter suppression, we're still dealing with that. Yes, you know, this fear of, of knowing the truth, right? True, very true. Susan said he needed Southern white votes to get reelected, right? And, and you can see the tensions that exist, you know, the, the same argument that even Alice Paul made to uh, Ida B. Wells in 1913 saying, oh, you know, basically it's not us, it's the Southern whites who don't want you to march 
side by side with us. They want you to march at the back of the line. Could you just do that to keep the peace, right? But Ida B. Wells says no. And even though, you know, Lyndon B. Johnson is known as this progressive president who was important in um, passing civil rights legislation and um, creating, you know, so many beneficial programs, still there's this tension um, between wanting to, to get reelected and get Southern votes. And I like to call the United States, I, I actually just started doing this in the past year or two, these yet to be United States because there's so many differing opinions and there's so much tension and so much of this tension goes back and it's rooted in the history of slavery and um, the manifestations of even gerrymandering today, voter suppression today has so much to do with trying to make sure districts are not predominantly black because predominantly black districts overwhelmingly, you know, historically vote democratic. I'm going to end with that, Alyssa, to, to make sure we have time for questions. All right. Well, thank you. That was, um, that was outstanding. Uh, I learned so much. I love, um, it's been a while since I was in school, but I love that feeling of like getting just like a really deep, engaging history lesson. So thank you. Um, that note you ended on about LBJ really made me think of a quote that I love from your article that, um, and we will, you know, I will just drop the link to the article in the chat box. Um, you say, the impact of white supremacy is broad and human nature is messy. And I just think, I think it's such an important thing to keep in mind as we grapple with our histories and right. think about how we move forward. I agree. And, you know, even when I was telling the truth about Alice Paul, you know, and the point is even these figures we celebrate includes, including Susan B. Anthony, you know, who was for abolition and was for, you know, anti-racism. She was against racism, but then when it looked like African-American men would get the right to vote before white women, she then flipped and used racist language and, and made arguments to the effect oh, you know, making arguments to white men in power, do you really uh, want these inferior people to get the right to vote before your own white sisters and, and mothers, et cetera? So that's what I mean, that human nature is messy. We see that, you know, there's this, this term, I think it's kind of a, I, I need a better term. Someone write into the chat a better term, bedfellows, you know, these political bedfellows that, that are, um, allies when the cause is um, working for both of them to be allies. But once it looks like, um, you know, someone might get ahead. Unfortunately, white women have had a history of throwing other people under the bus, you know? Yeah, we, act, we have a scholar from Rutgers who's going to come talk about her book, The Trouble with White Women in April, that is about that exact notion, how there is a long history of our feminist icons and our women's rights icons being there to be shoulder to shoulder with women of color and other marginalized groups until they think they're going to lose some of the progress that they've gained. And then it's, oh, no, 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 we'll keep what we have. Just, you don't have to give it to them as long as you don't take it from us. And that's a very real history that we have to confront because if we don't acknowledge it, we are going to repeat it. And we see that, we see it consistently. We see it, we saw it in the Women's March in, mm -hmm. um, 2017 and all of these like there are so many there's just there are more there are more examples than you know we could count like nobody needs us to really I think share them um sure. but can I can I uh make a comment based on something I saw in the chat sure. uh someone in the chat asked a great question moving forward how can um current day women's organizations really fight racism within the organizations and um, truly move forward in a way in which they're fighting for the rights of all women. This is an ongoing question that I have with my students. I, I teach um, a class called Feminism in the Diaspora and I teach a class called Black Feminist Theory. And we actually talked about this question this past week. We talked about how even um, during the classic uh, third wave feminism that uh, white feminists in so many ways really threw um, gay, lesbian, queer women under the bus, in my opinion, um, because they feared. The, the rationale was always, 
a one thing at a time. You know, we can't do all of this at once because your issue might hinder our progress. But as long as that type of thinking exists, then I, in my opinion, no one is fully free. Um, it, until we are all willing to stand in solidarity with each other because it's right, not only because I particularly have something to gain, but we are working together because it is the right thing to do, then I think we're going to just have divisions and problems. And um, one of my students made a great comment. One of my students um, said we could take cues from disability studies. And in disability studies, there is um, a focus on building relationships over time and accountability, improving you're an ally. So I think so many of our organizations just need that racial cultural diversity to be embedded uh, among its membership. But in order to do that, I think we just have to be very intentional in building relationships with other people from diverse backgrounds so that these organizations, the leadership, the membership is more diverse, but also, you know, to show up. The classic, um, well, the classic complaint was, where were all the white women feminists um, during the Black Lives, Member Lives Matter movement before George Floyd's tragic death, right? With the murder of George Floyd in Minneapolis, we saw, uh, you know, one of the biggest, uh, title changes in the composition of um, activists fighting for justice. We saw black, white, Latino, Asian. Uh, George Floyd's hometown is Houston, Texas. And my sister, well, my sister, like me, we're from Cincinnati, but my sister lives in Houston. And she, the day of his funeral, went to a memorial in the park. And um, while she was waiting for the funeral procession to come, she called me and she said, wow, I'm one of the few black people here. You know, it's overwhelmingly white, Asian, South Asian, and that's a good thing, right? But listen to this, this is the problem with America. We have amnesia and um, uh, NPR, National Public Radio is one of my favorite sources. I just listened to an NPR story that said, now, white support for the Black Lives Matter movement is even lower than it was before George Floyd's death. So we had this, this, you know, this increasing awareness when everybody was woke. And even that bothered me, I'll be honest with you. On one hand, I was happy that we were having these conversations, but on the other hand, as a historian, and as a person who has loved Black history since the age of 10, and has, has like literally, I remember being a 10 year old kid crying when I was reading about slavery. What bothers me is it took so much tragedy and loss of life to become woke. But look, that, that, that awareness is still declining now. Why is that? I, I heard someone say recently, um, it's great that you show up to, to support Black tragedy and Black sorrow, but where are you when we need you to support our Black joy and our Black excellence? That's important too. I agree. Um, so a final question that I have, and, I, uh, and then I'll address some of the thing, the more pre logistical things that people have been asking in the chat is, so as we, you know, as a, as a white woman working in a gender justice organization, trying to move towards a more intersectional future, this is something I think about a lot so this work that you're talking about, that we're all talking about needing to do, how do we acknowledge um, the problematic history of our movement and of our icons and move forward without falling prey to that white guilt trope that just perpetuates us centering the white experience and white voice more? How, like, what do you have suggestions or advice on how we do that? How do we create truly diverse and intersectional spaces? Hmm. I think, you know, acknowledging the truth is is where it starts, you know, and, and not being in denial and, and not making excuses, that's where it starts. But I think focusing on action steps, that's a great way to move forward. I, I was listening to a podcast, maybe some of the people online right now listen to Code Switch. And Code Switch uh, was making the point that 
it seems like the main thing that came out of all of this wokeness and awareness um, after the George Floyd tragedy, you know, the murder of George Floyd at the hands of a white police officer is liberal whites read a lot. <laughs> You know, is it important to read new books about racism and, and the problems at hand? Yes, but you have to do more than read. The, the part of the argument was the, the, the activism ended, you know, at the, the book counter, or the, the virtual book counter in the couch, but no one really did, did work. So I like to hear specific examples of, um, you know, white people, white women saying, hey, I'm going to support this um, Black community organization by donating money, by donating time, by donating something that, that actually might make a difference, not just reading and talking about it. But, you know, if you're an organization that's predominantly white, perhaps, you know, it, nothing comes to mind right in this moment, but it will take some research. Perhaps there are other organizations that are predominantly organizations of color that would, that would be open to working together if it's a project-centered uh, project endeavor. This is the tricky thing. When this happens, there are mistakes that can, that can be made. On one hand, you have to do some talking to unpack the legacies, the histories, and acknowledge possible resentments, right? Because if you don't talk at all, and if you just jump in and say, let's do this, you know, inevitably someone might say the wrong thing, and, you know, and then there's conflict. So, you know, I don't think there's any one formula for the best combination. It, it's case by case but you have to figure out what your collaboration needs. You know, how much talking and unpacking, and then when do we get to work and actually do something? And, and for me personally, I see myself as getting to work and doing something by working with Cincinnati Public Schools and um, working as a collaborator with a ninth grade teacher teaching 175 um, students who are underserved African-American history. That's me saying, okay, I'm not going to just talk about this. I want to do some type of work. Thank you for that. I don't know. I was taking, I took some notes because there are some things that um, I'm excited to think about more and talk about more with our organization moving forward. We are unfortunately out of time. I wish we I could just so keep this conversation going because this has been incredible. The yeah. chat has been so dynamic. Um, I love that all of you were talking with each other and talking with us. The slides for this per se will not be available, but you will be able to watch the recording of this on our YouTube channel. We try to get it up seven to 10 days after the live airing of the program. And we will be sending out an email to everyone in um, the coming days, probably on Tuesday, that with a program feedback form, please tell us what you thought of this. Tell us how we can do better. Tell us what you want to see more of. Um, if you want to reach out to Tammy, what's the best way to, what's the best email address to reach you at? So the best email address is uh, browntl3 at miamioh.edu. So even if you look up Tammy Brown, you have to remember it's Miami University of Ohio because there's a, we were, we were founded before Miami, Florida, by the way. <laughs> Sometimes people think I'm in Florida. No, I'm in Ohio. <laughs> so that is in the chat now everyone you can see you can all see it if you want this chat in the little area where you can type a message there's three dots next to the smiley face icon it says more click on it click save chat it will download to your computer so you can review all the things we talked about there um like I said just keep checking our YouTube channel we have a ton of great videos on there if you want to dive more deeply into gerrymandering into African-American women who are part of the New Jersey government and why um, they feel like it's so important to have more diverse representation. Those are two great ones to talk about this month. Um, and we have another great program coming up on Tuesday the 15th. We have a New Jersey State Assemblywoman Shavonda Sumter who introduced a bill to start a reparations task force in the state of New Jersey 
along with um, Jean-Pierre Brutus, who is the Senior Economic Counsel for the New Jersey Institute for Social Justice. And they're gonna be talking about reparations and why economic justice is a key component of gender justice. We've got some blog posts written by some staff members about black excellence and about the need for intersectionality in our movement and about how we grapple with the history of the organization and with the history of the movement and how we are hoping to move forward. So I would love for y'all to check all of those out and to see you on Tuesday. Um, as ever, we bring these programs to you for free. And so if you would like to support us, we appreciate it. You can hop over to our webpage and donate to help us continue to bring these to you. Tammy, thank you for your time. Um, thank you for all of your experience for sharing with us. Thank you and for having me. Thank you. Have a great weekend, everybody. Bye.